Um, good morning, everybody. So I'm the opening batsman, which makes me very nervous because um, English opening batsmen don't have the best reputations in, in the world, it seems to me. But um, I'm very pleased to be here. Let me put up my slide. Uh, I'm a researcher based at uh, Sprue, Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, and a member of the STEP Centre, which we heard about uh, a couple of days ago through its work on a manifesto. Um, my work is... I do a variety of research projects, but they all fall under the theme of, of governance for... Gov the governance of innovation for sustainability and the politics of that, those kind of governance processes. And I've done that in a wide variety of areas, low-carbon innovation, regulation of technologies in China, Argentina, uh, cleaner innovation in firms, how to green innovation systems, now, and also, more recently, some work on grassroots innovations, but in the UK. So I'm going to be talking about the UK this morning. Um, on Tuesday morning, Rajaswari Raina called for a kind of cosmopolitan approach to innovation for sustainability, recognising different innovation cultures and the different national and sub-national settings for innovation. And um, I've certainly learnt a great deal about um, the debates here in, in India over the last few days, which has been fantastic for me. Um, and hopefully there's something in this that might be of interest to you. It's in that spirit of simply contrasting and comparing that, that I'm here speaking this morning. And I think actually that kind of diverse, I mean, diversity is the lifeblood of, of innovation, it seems to be. It's these kind of combi combinations and contrasts and blending and what have you that drives things forward. Um, and in fact, it'd be bizarre if we all had a similar approach to innovation in that respect. Um, anyway, so this is what I really want to talk about. I have two aims in the, in the time remaining. One is to just, just it, provide some illustrations and let you know about grassroots innovations for sustainability in the UK. And then again on Tuesday morning, Usha Menon called for new methodologies for trying to get to grips with and understand better innovation for sustainability and the new challenges it's throwing up. And um, so then I'll sort of talk about how we're going, beginning to go about studying this phenomenon in the UK and it's far from perfect and developed, so I really welcome feedback. And then the final opening remark is, um, as well as being keen to come here and learn from the much longer and much more uh, where it, uh, experience with gra grassroots innovation, admittedly in a very different setting and with different purposes, as you'll see, um, but just to learn from the sort of depth of thinking about that here. And I've also been sort of collaborating with colleagues in South America, where, centering around Brazil, there's this... Uh, social technologies movement, and there's a um, network of Tecnologías Sociales, which you have to read Spanish or Portuguese to follow, unfortunately, but anyway, I think there might be interesting comparisons to, to be between these emerging, rising powers, if you like. Okay, so I thought I'd start with some examples of what we mean by grassroots innovations in the UK. I mean, our understanding of it is, is of networks of activists and organisations generating these novel bottom-up solutions to sustainability and that respond to their local situation and draw on their, the interests and values of the communities involved. And in contrast to kind of mainstream greening of business sort of um, pro problems, these initiatives often arise in civil, do arise in civil society arenas and and follow a kind of social economy logic rather than market economy logic. And I think the big difference is this is about people and communities often who are, have high consumption consumer lifestyles, and, and they're seeking to move out of that into a sustainable lifestyle. So that might be a big, big difference. Now, there are some projects that deal with um, poorer and marginalised groups in the UK and are about social inclusion uh, and improving their um, uh, livelihoods. But... I'd say, by and large, it's, it is about this sort of trying to explore new sustainability lifestyles. So we have, um, going around, innovations in exchange, the development of complementary local currencies. How do I? Um, ah, fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, 
so these are co co local complementary currencies, and the idea is to enable exchange without people having to have the national bank's currency, enable economic activity amongst people who have limited financial resources, or and, and or for people who have resources to keep that economic activity circulating in the local economy. These, these notes of exchange, uh, and this is an example from Lewis, near where um, IDS and Sprue are based, um, have to be spent in the local economy, have to be exchanged again. So the idea is you keep that wealth within the local economy. And they complement some of the kind of national currency that you need to invest in, in capital and equipment and so forth. Then there's also innovations in organisations, so kind of self-build groups um, as, a, as an organisational innovation that allows them to build uh, very low energy, low input ecological houses that are not available on the market. I say, so they're getting together and organising so that they can learn the skills, the schemes that then, they then can enter the sort of jobs market around green construction, etc. Then there's things like uh, community gardening and urban gardening, and actually, what's quite interesting is people trying to rediscover traditional varieties of food, and it's about trying to provision fresh local produce where, in some areas, there are what they call fresh food deserts because it's all supermarket food that's highly processed, etc. And again, links between um, local farms producing varieties of vegetables and pro providing a weekly box to uh, residents in, in, the, in the nearby town. So these are sort of organisational innovations. There are novel business models. I don't know if you can see that down here. This is sort of like uh, energy cooperatives where people invest in um, small wind farms or solar projects. And again, this is a way for kind of, you know, urban people to uh, be part of the kind of renewable energy investment. Or there are urban scale renewable projects as well, such as Brighton Energy Cooperative, where I learn. And the idea is that the revenues from these projects are then used to, to do energy demand reduction campaigns in the town, it's sort of circulating the economy, as distinct to a energy utility investing in these sorts of technologies and simply skimming off the rent and the profit for, for, it, for other purposes. So again, it's about localising solutions. This one's a bit of a stretch, there's sort of standards and a lot of standards and certification and civic regulation emerging from the grassroots. There is some technology development. This is a straw bale housing, so quite easy to build, very, very therm high thermal insulation. So experiments with technology. But it's fair to say that a lot of these, these innovate, grassroots innovations are more social and it's about creating this space and opportunities to use technologies. And then there are other ones like networks to promote sustainable social values, infrastructure provision, cyclists, um, pr planning and pushing for their own sort of uh, infrastructure cycle networks. And then some popular research as well. Okay. So locating this, this is, this is the tiny, um, it's not the best argument. These are the three systems of the economy. So we have a market system, the state system, and then the social economy. This is using work by John Pierce. And this is simply to try and locate grassroots innovation and make the point that it's, in the, it's arising in the social economy, community enterprises, social firms, voluntary organisations, social businesses and enterprises. And the point here is that a lot of our innovation theory has been derived from this setting, or maybe um, interactions between the state and the market. So one of the things that are interesting is to what extent does that innovation theory apply in the social economy and, and, and for grassroots, or how do we have to adapt it or come up with new ideas and theories? Similarly, in terms of defining grassroots innovation, we have two axes here. One is the, is the extent to which the process of innovating is open and participatory or closed and institutional. And then similarly, whether the outcomes of the innovation, the sharing of the benefits and the risks, are local and collective, or distant and private. And again, grassroots innovation is about high participation in the process and um, sharing in the benefits. And okay. Now, from a social justice, it's not really framed in a social justice way, grassroots innovation in, in, in the UK. But you could see how the ideas of procedural justice and distributional justice could be read off this. But actually how it's normally framed in the UK is as a community development issue, where, um, I mean, the UN definition going back 60 years is, you know, to promote better living for the whole community. So that's an outcome. Um, with active participation, and if possible, on the initiative of the 
the community members themselves. That's a pro the procedural point. So that's where we're sort of situating and beginning with our grassroots innovation. Now, with this slide, we're interested in what sort of knowledge is being created. Now, not everyone loves um, grassroots innovations. In the Well, there are a variety of framings and, and perspectives on them. And so all I'm doing in this slide is, is taking each of the, of the four framings in the literature and, and what sort of knowledge they they're particularly interested in, how that lens picks up and brings into the foreground certain types of knowledge production and puts into the background others. So some people see these things as visionary vanguards. They're pioneering new sustainable economies and societies. So they're sort of like focus for the, 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 the sustainable society to come. So the sorts of knowledge that they're interested in is... Um, what sort of socio technical, social and technological practices will we need under these new values and new, and new cities? What capabilities are required? What economic, social, environmental performance can we expect, but under the new criteria of sustainability, not the, not the existing criteria of market economies, well, or, or unsustainable market economies? Production and maintenance requirements. So it's the kind of how to do it, how to make this realize this sort of sustainability in practice. Others are more critical. They just see this stuff as a bit of an R&D lab for utopia, really, because it's missing the, t the, the, the cause of the problem. It's, it's mistargeting the thing. This is, the grassroots innovation is just a sort of symptom of deeper structural, economic, and political problems, and it's not targeting those structural things in its campaigns. So it's misplaced. So there are things like institutional misfit. There's insufficient infrastructure. Economic structures, lack of capital and markets, political context, you know, so it's why, why bother with this stuff? It's, it's fighting a losing battle. But of course, there's, I mean, there's, there's an old anarchist saying about be reasonable, demand the impossible. And actually, by trying to do these things, you make these, these, these structural problems much more visible and real in people's lives. And so you could say, actually, that, 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 that's actually a form of learning itself. So, okay, you learn that institutions are bad, but you also have ideas about how, to ref how they need to reform. And similarly with in a uh, political context, you know, you find the opposing powers and maybe hook up with social movements and target them. So that critique could be interpreted positively. Then there's a viewpoint, that this is simply a more pragmatic one but compared to the previous two, it's a coping strategy. So this is a third sector social economy absence of for things that are not being provided by the state and the market. So the fresh local, local food example. In supermarkets in the UK, you can buy dozens of varieties of yoghurt, but you can't buy local yoghurt made fresh on your doorstep. So this, these groups are trying to do that and perhaps pressure the supermarkets to figure out how they might do that if, if they're capable within that organisational model. So there's various lessons coming from that. And then the final viewpoint, which sort of um, I, I situate myself in, is actually this is the source of diversity. These, this, these are opening up niche spaces for experimentation <laughs> with sustainability. So actually... A lot of the lessons are kind of an amalgamation, if you like, or learning across all of, uh, all of the previous ones. OK, I'm running way over my uh, time. So, so what, but then there's how, so that's one aspect of the work we're doing. And then there's how do these grassroots innovations get established? And here, I think, you, you know, you, um, so put it, they require all, the, the point of this slide is the variety of things that need to come together in a kind of working configuration. So what one thing we're trying to do is understand those processes. Um, many of them struggle from grants to grants, uh, pub funding. Um, learning from failures is important, but actually it's different. You know, these, these groups can sometimes find it difficult to deal with failure. Um, they're, they're not as resilient to, to, to bounce back. So it, um, and how we sort of do this is using ideas from niche analysis. So in, in, in trying to understand these processes, we focus on the kind of expectations of the people involved in these groups and the sort of, the sort of narratives and views that they're using to try and uh, underst understand themselves why and what they're doing and how they're going about it. We look at the kind of networks and resource flows in their networks that are being constructed and then also the sort of social learning processes and how that kind of feeds back and, and make, you know, of course, them to reflect on what they're doing. So that's how we do that. But we also recognise, and the reason why we're not using a kind of innovation systems perspective is we want to understand how um, these processes are, are in the context of more orthodox innovation systems. We're trying to understand the interactions between them. And as you all know, there are various kind of path dependencies associated with innovation systems to do with 
the cognitive, to do business models, scale, infrastructure, etc. on that list. But, and there are obviously lots of organisations and institutions that sort of reinforce that. But these systems are under pressure in the UK to become more sustainable, and they're figuring out how, how on earth do we respond to that pressure increasingly. Um, and these uncertainties, these open, these inform searches for alternatives and actually the development of some of the technologies that the grassroots innovators benefit from. So there's a productive relationship in some respects. But it also creates space for grassroots innovators to kind of maybe get their voice heard and get some limited government support for, for what they're doing. So we're using this kind of niche analytical framework to try and bring these things together. So I don't, the, the writing's too small, but the basic point here is we're, looking, we're trying to look at a scale that's above individual projects. These circles along the bottom, if you can see them, are individual projects. So we're looking at how, do, how does the grassroots innovation spread from project to project? How does it replicate or scale up or translate into different settings and cha change? But then we're looking at these kind of intermediary processes that perhaps formalise experience. And, and there's this process of sort of learning from each project, what kind of shared rules, more abstracted experience and best practices, how does that inform the, the creation of the next sort of thing, the next project, and so forth. Maybe um, process for commercialising the, the grassroots innovations, etc. And there are a variety of orga intermediary organisations, and these are just a few, that exist to try and facilitate that, nurture, that, that process of um, supporting and developing the grassroots innovation. But again, remember, recalling that um, conventional innovation systems uh, can be um, uh, quite unsympathetic or unhelpful towards these processes. So another aspect of this intermediating work that we're looking at is how, how, does, how does this space for this, these processes, this sort of you know, diffusion, if you like, um, work and we sort of think well th this space has to do a number of things it has to shield these activities from the more harsh kind of selection environments and pressures of the innovation system it can't outperform on these on the conventional criteria that actors hold here and, that, and that's not the point these things are about trying to change criteria and perform sustainably not perform according to a conventional innovation criteria so there's some sort of shielding work required to kind of give it the space so it doesn't get closed down too quickly. And then there's nurturing processes. That's this kind of development here. And then finally empowering. How does this experience, how do they kind of engage politically to try and change and inform changes in wider innovation systems? So those are some of the research problems that, 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 that drive our study in the UK. And actually also that we're beginning to engage with colleagues in, in Argentina and Brazil exploring. It's works that this, makes sense, this framework makes sense and is interesting there, and, and learning from how they're going about studying social technologies movements. And I'd be delighted to kind of learn and have that kind of dialogue with, uh, with here, here in India as well, um, and learn what might be interesting and what's just irrelevant. Um, so the role of the intermediaries, um, in that process, okay, so working across this shield, practically speaking, that's kind of how, to, how we're conceptualising. Practically speaking, we see they're doing, they're supporting this grassroots activity networks and partnerships, as many of you here do as well, sharing experience and good practice and expertise. But there's also this aspect of opening up political space and making advocacy to policymakers. And an interesting thing, which I'd be interested, to, I think, to explore in this morning's session is that they're beginning to grapple with it sort of just comes it's not a big discussion it's, it's the ethics of this of, of innovation failures if they're supporting grassroots who don't have resources if it to bounce back from failure and yet innovation is built on failure so how if you're trying to encourage groups to do things and then it fails where do the kind of responsibilities lie for making good that situation learning from it productively um, and and making sure that those sorts of experiences don't kind of kill the whole process, if you like, and, and the ethics of that involved. Okay, last point uh, before I, I finish is some of the dilemmas, and this is the, the major one, I think, is conformal transfer. This is, again, very stylized, kind of using pictures to try and uh, get a, a, a lot across. But recall that the grassroots innovators are trying to, some of them are trying to be strategic and anticipate 
sustainable practices. Okay? So they have quite a deep understanding of sustainability and they're trying to practice a deep form of sustainability. Now, if this is prevalence and this is time, one, one thing that happens is if you notice the kind of the, the reductions in the numbers of, of points and the sharpness, if you like, of this thing, is this is the kind of commercialization strategy. We're going into markets. So the kind of sustainabilities that get knocked away and that left. So you go from maybe kind of like a deep green or a deep sustainability to a much more shallow product in markets that spread, that's very prevalent, successful in those terms, but has lost some of its sustainability. And that's one aspect, one kind of route. And I'll provide an example shortly. But at the same time, the more kind of value-laden um, niches persist as well, okay? Projects persist as well. So actually, let me, uh, yeah. So you get this grassroots niche is adapted to these pioneering settings. These diffusion into markets transforms the niche, and you, this radical sustainability is not part of the market innovation. So that's one thing we're, we're sort of observing a bit and, and want to understand more. But at the same time, these value-laden niches persist. Now, some of the reaction to mainstreaming is, is some, some groups say, okay, well, actually, this, the allure of being widely influential is not worth it, that we need to rediscover our radical roots and think of... Uh, and so you get reasserted sustainabilities, and, and then you get further interaction. So you're getting this sort of, I don't know, kind of like a dialectical sort of process going on here. So the real dilemma is whether you kind of you fit and conform strategy. Perhaps your sustainability is, is diminished, though. Or a kind of stretching and transforming strategy, but, but that's very... You have, in, unless you're empowered in other ways and you can really address that innovation system outside, beyond the niche, then that's going to be very, very difficult to achieve. I was going to, um, an example is organic food in the UK, where the originator of a very I, a local food economy vision originally, which they developed, but then the kind of commercialisation strategy led to kind of frozen ready meals like pizzas that you just throw in the microwave and don't really chime with the kind of whole food, fresh produce, freshly prepared ethic that was in the early vision of organic food and that's prompted a, a reaction to more kind of to local food markets and, and linking organic food into that so you can see these things happening simultaneously with different groups so this grassroots innovation very very diverse and exploration of strategies so this is where i finished and tried to kind of wrap up that um loads of thoughts and ideas that we're, we're puzzling over uh, in the uk context and the first is the that there are understanding niche opportunities is one aspect of the work that we're doing. And then, but then also recognizing the wider dilemmas. So there's kind of, you know, the creating the knowledge, building, trying to move along that arrow in the diagram from, and, and scaling up and diffusing grassroots innovations. But the problem that the innovation system leads are, are indifferent often. The, the innovate, grassroots innovation often depend for opportunities beyond their agency what we were saying about how the, the innovation system is coming under pressure and that's creating opportunities, but that pressure is deriving from beyond the grassroots innovators and perhaps um, coming from sort of wider social movements um, that really need to help open up innovation policy agendas further, I think, and, and, and get some kind of symmetry into the way innovation for sustainability is treated both in the market economy and in the social economy. So that's it. Thank you very much.